can't really see you, so that helps. Uh, <laughs> this is my first um, conference. Um, and yeah, really, I can't see anything. Amazing. Um, I will talk about typography and exhibition design. But first, since you have no idea who I am, I thought I'd do a little introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm a graphic designer and I live in New York, but for the first 25 years of my life I um, lived in Siberia and I decided to just show you instead of trying to explain. It's kind of on the opposite side of the globe from where we are now uh, and that's this vast area, part of Russia and um, the town that I'm from is like one of the bigger cities out there and it's kind of right smack in the middle of the whole Eurasian continent. Um, um, I would ask if anyone else is from there, but I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> so uh, when we go down to the street level, uh, that's what it looks like, and it's not a staged photo. Uh, and then, you know, I know you probably have heard many things <laughs> about what it is like. So. I decided to put as many GIFs on here um, to see if it crashes my laptop, but it works. So yeah, just to clear the air, it's all true and it's all real. Okay, yeah. So I've been fortunate uh, to work on some amazing projects, although I haven't been in the business for a very long time. So one of those is, um, wayfinding system for whole transportation systems and whole city, um, then some bespoke mapping projects for campuses, schools, and hospitals, um, some smaller wayfinding and signage projects for cultural institutions, um, some more fun um, typography-based illustrations. And just as a side note, this is a special issue on Russia back when we didn't talk about Russia every day. Uh, and then on the side, as a kind of a fun uh, project, I tried to figure out some things with type. Um, still figuring it out. Um, so today, I wanted to talk about uh, typography and exhibition design because that's one of the things that interests me a lot. And of course, no talk is uh, viable here without a historic introduction. So when I started looking into this, um, I can realize that that's a very relatively new thing, um, having any type or having any text in the exhibit. So that's how it used to be when um, we were just starting out with this idea of having objects and having paintings in the space. And um, it's a lot and it's pretty overwhelming and there are lots of people in fancy dresses. And if you ever wanted to check out kind of what a um, museum might look like, um, in the uh, 1800s, uh, you should go to uh, Sir John Soane Museum in London, which remains unchanged from how it was in 1833 by the Special Act of Parliament. Um, this is on the other side of the Atlantic, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, when it just opened. Again, a lot of people in fancy dresses just kind of mingling, and it's pretty hard to see what the art is and doesn't look like they're paying too much attention to that. Um, um, then something happened, which is really interesting to me to figure out. Um, this is the first exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in New York when it opened in 1929. So I don't know about this couch. Um, <laughs> seems like a questionable uh, thing to have. But you can see that already the walls are white and the paintings are spaced apart a little bit. And then, um, Next thing, this is only two and a half years later, say Museum of Modern Art, the couch is gone, uh, but that's not the thing that I wanted to point out here. If you look carefully next to the paintings and the objects, you'll see those little rectangular pieces with type that probably has the uh, artist's name and the title of the artwork and probably something about what year it was made at and all of that. And, we didn't go back, and this is, I could not mention everything that was happening um, in the world at the same time. Um, um, Russian avant-garde and Bauhaus and some of the similar movements trying to push uh, uh, the 
what was possible to do in terms of uh, reproduction of photo photography and infographics and typography at a large scale. And also, uh, we never really went back. So now, every time you go to an exhibition, you'll probably expect to see a title wall that people crowd in front of, and then you'll see like little section text that explains um, what was happening with the movement or with the historical era that they were talking about. And every, every object has little text next to it. Um, uh, those were revolutionary changes that brought on, for example, the expansion and the invention of the profession of the museum curator. So now we have those people who kind of uh, decide what's going to be on view because museums have such vast collections that they can't show you everything like they used to. So now they um, just select some works and explain them to us. So um, the, my hometown that I'm from had only two museums, one art museum and one a historic museum. So when I moved to New York four years ago, I was kind of um, amazed to find out that there are, uh, according to this Wikipedia article, there are 212 museums in New York City. Um, yeah, we have a lot of things like subway issues and small overpriced apartments and we have a lot of museums as well. Um, so I decided, as I was preparing for this talk, I decided that I would um, kind of go around and see what's happening with typography there and try to measure it and try to um, maybe have some conclusions for you. Um, and I focused on the body typography because there was just so much stuff going on with uh, all kinds of display and title type. Um, so this was some of the uh, photographs that I took during my um, research, and I managed to go to 13 museums over a period of six weeks, and they had 44 um, exhibits in them, um, 44 that I selected, and of them, 11 were um, permanent and 33 were temporary, which I think reflects kind of the state um, of business there. And I put together this spreadsheet um, it was like all the sizes and everything that I kind of was interested in finding out about. And there are some pretty interesting facts, I thought. Like, for example, in those 44 exhibits, there was only one use of slab serif. Um, I thought those were popular, uh, but not so much. But when I, when I ended up kind of with this spreadsheet, I, uh, there was no revelation at the end, and there was no like a big conclusion that I could tell you and say, like, wow, no one knew that before, and now we know. So I kind of, but the more I was uh, going to those museums, the more I kind of started thinking about the bigger trends and um, how that relates back to my work and what I can make of that. So I came up with um, kind of three notions that I wanted to talk about um, in the second part of my um, talk. Um, that I um, expressed in three words. And the first word is the word system. Um, I was pretty surprised that only four of those 13 museums had some underlying structure for how they organized like those little object labels throughout the museum. Uh, and you know, for me as a person, as I'm sure a lot of you are, I kind of, when there is, um, something that's a few points off every time or something is just very, very different from you going from one room to another. Um, it's noticeable, so I was immensely satisfied when I found a museum that didn't do that, that had one underlying system for that, and um, that made me think of this one project that I worked on um, in St. Louis for Washington University. Um, main library there, Orlin Library, has an amazing collection of objects, about uh, five and a half million uh, different objects, including everything from ancient coins to big costumes. So they were doing a, a renovation project, and one of the issues that they were encountering is that they wanted a system that made it easy for curators and the librarians to uh, create exhibits uh, easily without having to go 
through all the steps every time and having to figure out and reinvent the wheel every time. So this is what they had, obviously, I had to show that. This is what um, the team that I was on uh, came up with. Uh, this is a 60 foot long case. And uh, we figured out the system that was kind of a uh, um, kit of parts. We had pedestals and we had the back panels and we had different lifts and um, magnetic panels. Um, obviously, it's pretty complex, but the thing that's interesting is um, the way that you could standardize the way that the graphics appear in it. Um, so we decided to limit everything to this prefabricated uh, system. Uh, that it exists and kind of we chose the three levels of hierarchy so that already dictated what we're gonna do. We used, we had to use the type that was already licensed and even the colors were pulled from something that they already had before, but in a, I, I think, more logical or interesting way. Um, this is just condensed universe and like a modern cut of Baskerville that has a pretty big X uh, height. Um, so um, the reason kind of why we were doing it is we were trying to achieve this modularity and making it easy um, for them to maintain the system. So I made this uh, style guide for all the graphic labels that they could have. The goal of this is that um, I made uh, templates for them for every, every scenario that they could imagine in every color. So hopefully, um, this exercise just um, helps them every time they need to change out the exhibit. They go through this, they figure out what they need, and then they just um, input uh, their content into a template, and it's easy, and they can divert their resources uh, somewhere else. The second notion is the idea of identity. Um, I noticed that uh, a lot of exhibits uh, these days have to do a lot of like, work to um, figure out the marketing strategy and make it recognizable and make, make their exhibit kind of an event and a thing of itself. Um, so I was pretty surprised when um, throughout my survey, um, I saw there were um, 16 out of 44 exhibits that were kind of doing this thing um, in a very definitive way, one way or another. Um, by identity, I kind of mean that um, in a way where there is, uh, is there a special type treatment or custom type or um, some way that the type is rendered in an interesting way like hand painted or um, three dimensional. So um, a couple years ago, I was also working on this exhibition for um, uh, San Diego History Center down in obviously San Diego. They were uh, making an exhibit about um, history of uh, Jewish heritage uh, down in California. And um, the basic notion of this was that um, people uh, who came there um, fleeing from persecution um, as soon as California became a state in 1850, um, they made this place their home and they adapted to it and they changed the place as well. So a lot of the content was very place-based and even the name for the exhibit that they uh, came up with was Celebrate San Diego. Um, so uh, we did this concept sketch um, and I was very um, kind of concerned about how the letters uh, looked. <laughs> so I thought this is a good opportunity to do something that's interesting. And I looked a lot um, at kind of what Hebrew might look like as printed or as um, hand-lettered uh, type or written with a um, nib. There were lots of um, restraints functionally because we kind of determined that we need as much uh, space we, as we can get because these letters would have to have exhibits on the other side because that's what we were using them for. Um, we were thinking that it needs to have a base and it's an eight, eight foot square. And then also we were thinking it's probably gonna be made out of um, two sheets of MDF that's uh, four by eight um, feet uh, dimension. So I had to figure out how to do the counters and if I could shift the counters or not. Um, so this is kind of what I ended up uh, doing with them. So the fronts were these images and the backs were um, the content. 
And this is what came back from the fabricator, which is pretty exciting because that's how the Bezier curves translate into Creel MDF, which is really exciting. And I was going to say that um, this is kind of the biggest probably way that I would ever see my lettering because it's total 10 feet tall with the base. Um, but this screen is actually, I think, about the same height. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that tops that. Um, yeah, this was also very exciting because they made it, you know, they made the lettering out of real material. Uh, while they were doing that, I did this logo, and so I had to draw additional characters uh, for that. Um, and then I was kind of like, well, I already have that many characters, why not make it a type? Um, so no one has asked me to do this. I kind of just like sat at my desk um, for a long time and tried to figure it out and how it was going to work. Um, <laughs> and, and the client was like, oh, OK, can we have that? <laughs> um, so obviously, it's unusable for any of the actual body text. So we had to kind of uh, follow through on this kind of broad nib idea and use something from Indian type foundry called Bradmas, which I think worked pretty well. But um, I do think that you know this kind of is interest an interesting study of what an identity of the show could be if you actually build the letters. And the third and the last notion is this idea of expression. It makes me think, because I have a regular kind of graphic design background, when I started doing exhibitions, it always um, made me kind of confused why um, some of them don't try to have um, the content of the exhibition um, reflect on how everything looks. And I know like there are multiple reasons for why that happens, which I can't go into now. Uh, but uh, basically, I think this is a bit subjective, but 25 out of 44 shows uh, in my research did that one way or another. Sometimes it gets very subtle, like for example, uh, when you're doing a show on painters of a certain time period, you just use type that was um, cut during that time period, so it gets pretty subtle. But this year, earlier this year, the same clients and the History Center came back to us because they were doing um, a show on uh, history of uh, gay, lesbian, and transgender community um, down in California, and they got a hold of amazing archives. Uh, they had just really powerful photographs, and they had a lot of the early protests and pride marches and people fighting for equality and fighting for their rights. Um, so we thought this was extremely powerful on its own, and we would just use the, their house typeface, which is Kawasans, and kind of try to have the images pull all the weight. But then it seemed like uh, it just was very plain and very uninteresting. Um, so I had the one night to do this, um, and I thought, why not try? Um, so I tried doing this, and I had in mind that square type that I showed you just a few minutes ago because they kind of kept it and were using it. But mostly I was trying not to have any round shapes because I knew I would be very frustrated in translating them into um, actual outlines in the type software. So I, I only had this, and, and then I kind of left, scanned it, and left, and then I spent kind of the rest of the night uh, in doing, <laughs> making this. And it's definitely, like, it's not perfect at all, and it, it's not even the right word. That's how it looks in the layout. But I thought it was interesting enough, and even if it's, there is a 1% of the power of those protest posters that I showed you before in this, or emotion, or anything close to that. I thought that would be really cool. Um, some more of it here. And I heard here today that imperfections are good. But the client didn't think so. <laughs> they, yeah, they, they said, we don't think that any respectable institution would ever go for something sloppy like that. And I don't actually know if that's not true, so I can't say that it's not true. Maybe it is. 
Um, but projection is good too. So now I have this thing, maybe I'll use it somewhere else. And this is what they ended up with. Um, and um, um, I just kind of thinking about this, I, I think I just do it for love. So I don't need any external kind of like client saying this is great or not. I will keep doing it anyway. And maybe um, after I do it 20 times or 30 times or 40 times, I'll come back here and you know, it will be better. But I will keep doing it anyway. That's it.